Okay, so today, hopefully nobody heard that, uh, <laughs> natural selection is going to be our topic. So, so far, um, what you just took your quiz over was from last week's lecture notes and from the pre-lab activity and from two days of the lab activity. So you had four days reviewing the exact same topic in a row. So we know evidence that supports the theory of evolution, okay? What were our different lines of support from the lab activity and the pre-lab and the lecture notes? Can somebody give me an example of one of them? One of the evidence, one of the five types of evidence for the support of evolution. <laughs> huh? Good. Embryology, right? At station five over there, we looked at embryos and how the development is similar. Yes. Good. The fossil record is another thing that supports evolution. Homologous and analogous structures, very good. And DNA sequencing, amino acid sequencing. All right, so those were all different things that we looked at. So today we're going to look at how evolution occurs. Lurk at, I know, I don't know. How it occur, how evolution occurs. So there's going to be four things you need to know for the test. Natural selection, sexual selection, non-random mating, genetic drift and gene flow, and random mutations. Okay, today we're going to talk about natural selection. So natural selection, you can see this bird ate all the what colored beetles? That's green. What's left? The orange ones, okay? So obviously the birds preferred the green beetles, so they ate them all, and after a few generations, were there any green beetles left? No. Okay? So all of a sudden now, the whole population is made up of red beetles and no more green beetles. I think they were Christmas beetles. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> terms to know that we will cover in this lecture and you should have covered in your vocab. Natural selection, fitness, adaptation, stabilizing, uh, disruptive, and directional selection. Okay, so Charles Darwin, he is that... Adorable little man in the corner? Ew. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he was adorable in the 17, 1800s. I highly doubt it. Not my, not my type, but... I think it's your type, is Parker. Natural selection. Process by which individuals... So at the top of your notes, it says defined as the process by which individuals that are better suited... Better is your first blank. better suited to their environment, survive, and reproduce most successfully. Do you guys know the other term for natural selection? It's often called... Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> See other classes, this is why my sixth period struggle. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Oh. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Okay, Survival of the fittest. Is the, excuse me, fitness, I know. Fitness is the ability of an organism to survive and reproduce in its environment. So fitness is the ability of an organism to survive and reproduce, very good, in its environment. This results in changes of inherited characteristics of an entire population. This is super important, okay? Star it, circle it, draw a cat next to it, I don't care. But you need to know that natural selection happens to populations. Evolution is not seen in individuals. One animal does not evolve. The whole population changes over time. 
okay? And that change in the population is what evolution is. Okay, so natural selection acts on variation. Acts on variation or differences. Okay, obviously, if you look at the population of people at Etiwanda High School, there's obvious variations between us, right? I have blonde hair, Adrena has brown hair, Sage has darker brown hair. I have blue eyes, you have brown eyes, you have green eyes, I'm sunburnt really bad because I went outside for a whole hour, <laughs> okay? So natural selection acts on phenotypes. That is really important. It acts on the way that physical characteristic is expressed, okay? So it acts on phenotypes but results in changed allele frequencies. So for example, if we all go to Death Valley, there's like no shade there and it's super hot all the time, right? I might get a sunburn and die off within the first week, okay? And then I'd be less likely to pass on my genes to future generations. So that means the allele frequency for blonde hair, blue eyes, and super pasty white skin is going to go down, okay? because I was less protected from the sun in Death Valley. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. All right. Organisms with favorable traits or adaptations contribute more to the next generation. So if you go to Death Valley and you're like, I don't get sunburnt and I can eat cactus spines and live from it because I'm awesome, you are probably going to have more offspring than sunburned in the corner me that's dying sadness right okay this is just a picture showing you how evolution occurs in a population not in an individual so we have I'm gonna just gonna say these are flatworms okay there's mama flatworm she's gray she has a white flatworm baby a gray flatworm baby and a dark flatworm baby and the white one obviously gets sunburned and dies instantly. So that sucks to be that one. It's out. Okay? Now we have the gray and the dark gray one. The dark gray one and the gray one have babies and they have babies. But then let's say they're living in a lake and it gets polluted. And the light gray babies cannot handle the pollution. So they die. So over time, we see this change from a lot of variation where it was possible to be a light gray or white flatworm. And by the end of it, we only see what? The dark, the dark gray flatworm, okay? You guys love my examples. All right, four requirements for natural selection. These include variation. So just like we've talked about, physical differences amongst us. Differences amongst population. Heritability. Traits that are genetic. So you have to be able to pass it on, right? If you're like immune to sunburns, you would need to be able to pass that down to your children so that they also don't get sunburned or if you can see really well in the dark, or during broad daylight. So traits are genetic, meaning they can be passed on. Overproduction. That means you make more offspring than will survive. Okay, your goal in terms of biology is to grow up and reproduce as many kids as you can. And if a few of them die, that's okay, because you made some extra. Isn't that really 
Okay, the last um, requirement for natural selection is reproductive advantage. Okay, a reproductive advantage is an organism who can survive to reproduce will produce more offspring. So, for example, if you suffer from a chronic illness and your life expectancy is till 14, okay, are you likely to reproduce many children? So, peppered moths. The classic uh, example of natural selection are these peppered moths. Way back in the day, there were light moths and there were dark moths. Okay? Obviously, which one blends into the tree on the left? The dark. The lighter one. Thank you, those of you who know your left and right. Okay? So the light one is easily camouflaged in there. Come around to the Industrial Revolution, and there's all this pollution in the air, and it builds up on the tree bark and makes it darker. Which moth is better camouflaged now? The second one, the bottom one. Okay. 1960s come around. Actually, the early... 50s all the way through the 60s we start passing pollution laws to regulate how much pollution there is trees go back to their original color and now which one's more popular okay so that is showing you how selection an advantageous trait such as camouflage changes the population okay so an adaptation is a trait an adaptation is an inherited trait, an inherited trait that is beneficial to an organism's fitness, like Fergie, working on her fitness. Y'all might be too young for that reference. I don't even I love know. Her. Okay. <laughs> that was so bad. Yeah. All right, an example of an adaptation is mimicry. You spell mimicry, which you need to write below, examples of adaptation. Mimicry. Like Mimi cry. But you sound dumb if you say Mimi cry. <laughs> mimicry is when you look like something else to protect yourself. This snake is extremely poisonous and will kill you. This snake can't hurt you at all. So this one is pretending, as they called it back in my day, he's a poser, trying to act like the venomous snake, okay, so that other things don't eat him. It's called fake. Fake? Just being fake? So, as we've seen, there are changes in the environment that can cause selective pressure, like the moth example, okay? Organisms who survive better have more chances to reproduce, and therefore pass off their trait, and this trait may not be favorable in other environments. So there are three types of natural selection, flip your paper over, and they are stabilizing, directional, and disruptive selection. You will need to draw these three graphs. It's okay. This is Stabilizing, directional, and disruptive under each example in your notes. Okay? Let me give you an example. Stabilizing selection. That's your blank. Selects for a medium trait. A great example of this is human birth weight. Does that baby look healthy? No. Does that baby look skinny? Yes. Is that beneficial to be underweight? No. So, stabilizing selection prefers a medium trait. So the center of this graph is going to be the most favored. That's because if you look at human birth weight, right? If you're really low birth weight, like a preemie, like this poor baby, your chances of survival are not that high. If you are born and you are super, super big, that's not healthy either. One, you could have delivery complications, so you would need a C-section, and all that kind of stuff, okay? So babies that are born in usually about the six to eight pound range are usually the healthiest, and therefore um, that medium trait is what is selected for. Directional selection or favoring an extreme trait. So in this case, this is exactly like the peppered moths. 
that we saw, okay? There were white peppered moths, there were a few black peppered moths. The pollution came into play. The trees got darker, now there were a lot more dark moths and less white moths. And disruptive se selection picks either both sides of the graph without the middle. So you can see here if you have a short bird beak for picking up seeds and things like that, then that is favorable because you can get lots of seeds. If you have a long beak like a pelican or something, that's favorable because you can get fish. But if you have a medium beak, there isn't much food for you. You can't compete against the seeds. Uh, seed-eating birds and you can't compete against the fish-eating birds so you're a little bit out of luck and since that's harder for you to eat and survive it's harder for you to reproduce so we see this uh, development of two waves instead of just one so that should be it for our natural selection lesson hopefully that gave you a good idea of how natural selection works and tomorrow we'll be looking at this concept a little bit more